Zorro, uh, why did he mean so much to you? Uh, to me, that was the perfect specimen of a dog for I did Rob. At 70 pounds, 72, three pounds, uh, he was light on his feet. He ate everything. If you threw your shoe down there, you better grab it because he's going to take toe off of it. Um, perfect feet. Nice, tight, little dark feet. They don't spread out and get cuts and all the stuff that some of these dogs do now. Nice, thick fur. There's no dog blankets and, you know, sheath protectors and wrist wraps. And, uh, so Zorro, to me, was just that guy. He always had a positive attitude. He never doubted uh, the conditions. I mean, he never, he never balked at anything. And, and the one thing that I realized on my very first Iditarod was uh, if I'm going to beat Jeff King or Martin Booz or any of these guys, I can't copy what they're doing. If I copy them, I'm already racing for second. If I, I got to come up with something a little different. And uh, that to me was a little different. That was a dog that nobody would look at, you know? Uh, 2008, while mushing the uh, all Alaska sweepstakes, uh, take it from there. Uh, we had, there was two other teams basically and myself that was racing for first, Mitch Seavey and Jeff King. And uh, 22 miles from the finish line is a place called uh, Safety Roadhouse. And it's, it's the place that all the locals from far away come they have a few drinks, they get on their snow machines, and they ride back to Nome. And this trail is 40 feet wide, and it's as hard as this floor. Uh, I had a little bit of an issue with Zorro because he hadn't been trained adequately from the end of the quest. Or excuse me, from the, yeah, end of the quest to Iditarod, and then from Iditarod. He had, he had a few issues, and he wasn't quite keeping up. So I put him in a sled. And he was just going to ride. By now, I was going to be third. I knew that, which is fine. I had a great race. Uh, past Safety Roadhouse, a whole group of snow machiners there. Didn't think too much of it. But I'm always looking behind me, just, just checking the trail, see if anybody's coming. I'm aware of snow machines. See these two headlights coming at me. Well, this one is just it's coming fast. and. Uh, yeah, this is a 40, 50 foot wide trail. Pretty soon he's getting close enough where I shine my light right in his helmet. It's quite obvious he's going to hit me here in a second. And, well, just a split second before he did hit me, I just jumped as high as I could in the air. Because I felt, I don't know how fast he's going, but I know if he hits me and I jump in the air, I'll probably land on top of him. Which is exactly what happened. And you couldn't line it up better if it was sitting in this living room right now. He hit that um, sled at about 70 miles an hour. Of course, when he hit the sled, the whole team got, got like, drugged backwards and up underneath the sled, up underneath the snow machine. And when it came to a rest, my sled was on the side. The snow machine was wedged in it. One ski was through the sled bag. And now this other snow machine has finally come up. And, uh, and he's kind of trying to assist me. And the guy right here, he's still just standing there. And I'm, and I'm yelling at him, get your damn snow machine. I mean, I'm very polite at this moment. You're right, you're right. Uh, get your sled off, you know, snow machine off my sled. I got a dog in here. And he wouldn't budge, he wouldn't move. He was just like motionless. And me and this other guy, you know, we got the snow machine off and I tipped the sled up and I got the dog out. And, oh, he looks fine. He, I mean, he, of course he's distraught and he's like, what just happened? All the other dogs, they're freaked out. They don't know. I mean, they just got ripped backwards. They had, who knows exactly what happened. I didn't see it all yeah. happen. We got them all lined out. I checked everybody. They weren't broken. They weren't, you know, nothing was really wrong. Other than just, you know, really sketched out. Well, now, my attention turns to this guy. And me, I'm very polite. And this moment, I forgot about all that stuff. And I not only came up with names that everybody knows, I made some up. And I continued to yell and scream and spit and told him, if he's any kind of a man, you will find me at the finish line, you'll make this right. So we get to the finish line, it's, I don't know what time in the morning, three or four in the morning, and it, uh, there's a huge crowd of people. And I wasn't gonna ruin their day. 
These people came to see me. And they came for a, you know, a reason, and I wasn't going to ruin their moment because of something that happened. And Zorro wasn't really, he wasn't acting himself. So I took him with me, and I put him in the house, and I put him in the kennel in front of the heater. You know, he ate and he drank, and but he, just, he just didn't act right. I went to sleep. About three hours later, I just had, I sat up right in bed. I knew something was wrong. And, and his, he's laying in his kennel with his head on the floor and his tongue all the way out. And I thought he was dead. I mean, he looked like it. And immediately, I didn't even, I, I don't even know how I knew, but I grabbed the phone and I just dialed the vet number. I'm like, Denny, you got to get up here. There's something wrong with my dog. He said, what happened? I said, well, nobody knew this, but I got hit by a snow machine last night. And, uh, and Zorro's, he looks dead. He, and um, she came right over. And she said, his dog needs to get medevaced right away. Uh, it had busted his, busted a couple of ribs. He was bleeding from his spine, spleen. Basically, he had to be sent to, um, he had to be uh, medevaced down to Seattle. And uh, I got down there, you know, it took a while in the process to get to the, to the vet station there. And uh, this lady meets me at the door. And she said, uh, you know, he's in there and uh, he's, he's on IVs and he hasn't moved. He, uh, you know, he's lifeless. And I said, I don't care. I want to see him. And I walked in. And I seen him laying in the bottom of the cage there, you know. And I knelt down and I opened up the door. And I put my hand on him. And I said, I'm here, man. And his tail started doing this against the floor. And I said, he's going to live. And not only is he going to live, he's going to walk again. And they all looked at me like, how can you say that? And I said, trust me, this dog's going to walk again. And that dog, I swear to God, he looked at me and he's like, we're going to walk. Let's do this. What do you want to do? I mean, I, I never doubted him. And he never doubted me. And that was, I mean, I, I'm that way with all of them. I do not put them in a situation that's going to jeopardize their life, their future, or their career. And I'm going to be there if something does happen, you know.